Are you sitting comfortably? Then we'll begin. What's happening guys? I put up on my Instagram and Facebook a few days ago about an Ask Me Anything and loads of people came in with some questions and I'm gonna answer them. Seems sensible. So first question comes from Graham McDonald. And he's, he is asking best book for learning drum notation. So two part question. Firstly, you're trying to learn drum notation, in which case get any drum book, have a look at the key, start reading. That will make the reading of drum notation easier. Now if it's drum music, reading drum music is the same as reading music. So I would recommend you get a book like New Breed and then work on sight reading that, or not necessarily sight reading, but working through reading it, working it out, counting it out, having a look and look at those note heads and those note shapes and the tails to tell you what they are. I would definitely recommend that you get some lessons on that stuff. You can come for a couple of lessons and just read, learn to read, and then you'll be set for most things. Uh, second question comes from James Lansdowne. I've been drumming for seven to eight years, maybe look at this, um, but never took the time to learn the rudiments. How do I go about learning them? That is the most common question I get, or common complaint I get when an established drummer comes for lessons with me. Because um, I teach a wide variety of people. I teach beginners, I teach not beginners, I teach um, advanced people for like one-off lessons, and everyone in between. So when someone comes to me, I inevitably know that their question is pretty much gonna be, I'm bored of the fills I play, I'm bored of the grooves I play, I want to play new things. And inevitably, what it boils down to is they haven't learned their rudiments. So, how do you start? I would highly recommend that you start with Tommy Igo's Lifetime Warm-Up. The DVD is called Great Hands for a Lifetime. It is simply the best way I've found of combining your rudiments. So, when I was taught, way, way back when, my teachers were kind of giving me the very much, like my first one especially, it was like, well, here's a single throat roll, go and practice it. And back in those days, I was mad into my metal and I wanted to just play like Machine Head and System of a Down. There was no connection there. Also, it was pretty dull because it was like, oh, go and practice it and I would just sit on a pad for two minutes and think I wasn't making any progress. So the great thing about Tommy Aguirre's Lifetime Warm-Up is it ties everything together. You start with this, you add this bit, you combine it with this bit, you learn this bit. The DVD is awesome. Tommy's awesome at explaining it. It's got a basic, intermediate, advanced side. It is kind of what I would give, it is what I give to every single student, no matter what, it, what level they are. The life, Lifetime Warm-Up is spectacular in doing the thing that it's designed to do, which is to answer your question, how do I start learning rudiments? Once you've got those under your hands, man, your creativity will explode and you'll have these ideas um, there on tap when you're playing music. Because it can't be, I'm gonna apply my rudiments. It can't be, I'm gonna use this technique. It's just gonna be music driven. Next question, Tim Powell, former student of mine, asked, outside of drumming, what music do you listen to? Um, I don't really listen to a lot of drumming music as such. I'm not big mad into fusion or, although it's kind of cool, uh, it kind of bores me a little bit. I'm a song person. I love singer-songwriters. I, If I could have one dream gig, it would be Sarah Bareilles or something like that. It would be sit behind a great singer, let them do their thing, and I will help you make your music sound as good as possible. That's my vibe. That's one of the reasons why I don't particularly mind doing weddings, because it's songs. It's playing songs that I like to listen to with people to support. If you get a good singer, if you get a good band, it's really awesome, because it's songs. And as drummers, I'll caveat that, we are musicians who play the drums. And if you think about it, when you're playing, when you're a musician, your focus is on the music. When you're a drummer, your focus is on the drums. Um, Music-wise, uh, to answer his question a little bit, um, Sarah Bareilles. I like lots of musical stuff at the moment. Um, and then I just put on the daily mix on Spotify and just put on things like that. And uh, I've got a question here from Thomas um, Moyer. I'm gonna go with Moyer. And he has asked, how do you start instructing drum clinics? And how do you go about getting them? Um, okay, Mythbuster, number one. There's not really any money in clinics. There's not any money for the shops. There's not any money for the stores. They are the same thing. There's not any money for the companies. There's not really any money for the artist. Um, the artist is probably the best paid out of them. Clinics are there to get people together, which is good, but there's so many people out there doing clinics that getting people out all the time is really hard. You have to have a sort of personality behind it. You have to have a profile. It's really hard to get clinics. So even myself, and I'm like the lowest of the lowest of the lowest run, Booking clinics is not the easiest thing. Selling tickets to clinics is not the easiest thing to do. Um, 
and so subsequently I've priced myself at the lowest possible run so it's cost effective no matter where I go in the country. Firstly, don't look to get into drum clinics because look into teaching, look into doing gigs, look into being a musician and just the clinics will happen if you've got something to say. Um, so firstly, practice really hard, get really good, do things that musician, that drummers should do. Gigs, teaching, do some recording and then develop you as a person and as a drummer, have ideas. Now I've been playing for 18 and a half years, I was doing 10 or so, 13 or so maybe, years of just playing the drums without even any thought of putting anything online, doing anything. Anything like that, just living in my own little thing, just doing away, living, teaching, enjoying myself, having a professional musician's life. And then out of pure chance, I was in the drum shop, Drum Central at a the time, they asked me to do the online lessons for them, along with some other guys, and then just sort of snowballed from there. I found that I really liked it, and fundamentally, that led me to being able to have a body of work behind me to do clinics. So bear in mind, this is now 13, 14 years into me playing the drums. And I have been a professional, I've graduated from various college things, I've done lessons, I've done camps, I have a form of my ideas. So that when I go and do clinics, A, I've got a body of work for people to know who I am, because there are so many amazing drummers that I know of because I'm in the drum community, but other general everyday drummers who are out gigging or playing or into different types of things, if they're not into the drum stuff, they aren't gonna come to a clinic for this guy who ha I know is a beast, but is not um, well known enough. So having a body of work to show people, to be like, oh yeah, that guy, I know that guy from online, I'll go and see him play, to then have something to say when I get to that clinic. So all my clinics, all my teaching, all my online website that I'm gonna build and it's in progress and all that sort of stuff is geared around how do I make you practice better? And how do I make you achieve your goals? Because I cannot tell you my goals, I can't just give you stuff to practice. So my ideas sort of stack on top of all the other stuff that you're working on, all the other influences and educational content you've got and all that sort of stuff. That's what my stuff stacks up on. So I think that's a pretty unique thing which allows me to do a clinic and then people walk away and say, oh, that's pretty inspiring and oh, I feel like I could use that. Whereas not just the chops fest, because to be honest, I'm not a chops player. I don't have them. I want them, but they're not there yet. So you gotta think about it. Like no one, does anyone know who you are? Do you have any, a body of work behind you? And do you have a, any sort of way of adding value to this, the clinic online space? So if you do, go ahead and do it. Start making some videos on YouTube, on Instagram, go and do that and add value. If you're just gonna add noise and just wanna do clinics because it's performing in front of drummers, then I would say that's the wrong thing to be doing. The battery died. Got one here from JHNLK. Um, do you use flams or paradiddles more on working gigs? I use them all because they are musical ways of expressing time. And as I talked about, or I'll talk about in a future video at some point, a big concept of mine, a big clear perspective or driving force is that playing drums, playing music, playing the drums or music through drums is really about flowing within a note value. And when you're filling, when you're grooving, it's just there's a flow of notes. Because as soon as you start time, all subdivisions have started. So if you go one, two, three, four, that's your time, so that's started. It hasn't stopped yet. Now, on top of this, we've got 16 notes, so. Triplets, eighth notes. Swung eighth notes, da-da-da-da-da. Quintuplets, da 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 And everything in between, quintuple eighth notes, da-da-da-da-da. All of these exist, and you just can't hear them. Like, I can't hear quintuple eighth notes over the top of quarter notes yet. So all my stuff, my flams, my paradiddles, my Swiss triplets, my paradiddle diddles, my quin blues de five things, they all fit inside those subdivisions. I just can't hear them yet. So I can choose to play them. Blah, 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 Fundamentally, drumming is singles and doubles played through different subdivisions. That's it. 
to me at least, that is my core kind of idea behind it. And once you free your mind from having to play a paradiddle, okay, here's a paradiddle, and then, oh, here's a flam, and then here's a flam, and then a paradiddle, and there's a flam blue fladabada. When you free your mind from having to play different um, specific patterns and more of a general pattern with a flow within it, you'll find you'll play paradiddles, flams, pataflaflas, all these sort of things will just happen naturally because of the flow and the shape that happens within them. I use paradiddles a lot, I use flams a lot, I use all the rudiments a lot, I use singles and doubles a lot. Um, I have tendencies though, and that's probably maybe where more your question's going. So if I'm in a 16th note triplet format, I'm playing a lot of four and twos. Four in the hands, two in the feet. I'm doing a lot of that. I don't want to do a lot of that. I want to do four plus one, and that's what I'm working on at the moment, trying to develop my triplet vocabulary outside of the things I always do. Okay, next question. Uh, from Pete Barber, he actually asked two questions. First was what plugins do I mix with? Stock Cubase Artist LE, or whatever the basic Cubase is, those plugins. There's a free one called Nova EQ, which I use, and then I'm just sort of making stuff up on that front, um, more so than drumming. So when I'm filming, I've got four mics um, and a lapel. That's it, the lapel obviously doesn't make it into the mix. And then I just do some standard drumming things, uh, sorry, mixing things. I bus a mix of uh, the four mics. I think it's more overheady and I slam it through a compressor and that sort of adds a little bit of crunch. It's called parallel compression. Um, I think, I don't know. I just got told it would sound good. So I did it and I continue to do it. A little bit of reverb on the snare, stock Cubase one, and then try to make it sound good. Um, I've had a lot of comments on how good this room sounds. I think it's the room. Um, it's the drums as well, um, a little bit of me as well, probably in there. And then just decent mics. It's only going into a Behringer XR18, which is a interfacey live mixer thing. And I'm just trying to make it sound as good as possible. I think there's a lot to be said for doing it with the stock ones before you start buying stuff. Um, your second question though is a really important one actually, a really deep one. When it comes to gigs and getting paid, are you better to stick your price and lose the gig or be underpaid but still have the work? Another story. I'm full of stories, as my students will attest to. Um, I was at a, ma a, not a masterclass, a sort of intensive camp, as they're called now, but it was called the Ultimate Drum Experience by Mike Dolbert. It's awesome. And I went three years in a row. It was amazing. The first year was incredible. The second year was incredible. The third year was incredible. And they changed the teachers every time. So in the second year, it was Jojo Mayer. And we're sitting at the end, having a drink or whatever, and we're asking various questions. something very similar to that. And obviously, Jojo was known as Jojo from Nerve and Jojo the Beast of the Hands. Obviously, he's going to make a living doing other things. And he talked about this three elements to it. And if two of those elements are ticked, he will take the gig. So money, people, and music. So if the money's good and the people are good, but the music's a bit naff, he'll take the gig. There's a nice philosophy to do. It's like, don't, if the people aren't nice and the money's crap, don't do the gig. Um, Secondly, I'm a firm believer in charging what you believe you are worth. Not what the market tells you is worth, but what you believe you're worth. So turn down gigs for money that is not adequate to what you believe you're worth. And then be honest with yourself. Are you providing enough value to warrant 200 pounds a gig, 300 pounds a gig, 700 pounds a gig, 2 million pounds a gig, whatever it is. And the unfortunate thing about this industry is there's a lot of a race to the bottom. Like I will do that gig for 50 pounds. No, I'll do it for 49 pounds. I'll do it for free for exposure, which is really, really bad for the industry. If you value yourself and you value your time and your skill as a musician, then definitely, definitely charge what you believe you're worth and stick to your guns. Um, it sounds like to me from your, from your post that you lost the gig because you wanted more money or wanted what you felt you were worth, which means the guy didn't value you. So, they're lost, man. Go find another gig and smash it. And then keep smashing gigs and keep people happy that you were there and eventually you'll be charged what you believe you're worth or you'll find a band that wants to pay you properly. Right guys, that is it me for today. I will catch you very soon in the next lesson. I hope you enjoyed this. If you've got any more questions, just hit me up at any point. DM, email, Facebook. I'll see you guys very soon. Take care.